I am Pyle, and today I'm going to talk about provisioning and automating high availability Postgres on EC2. I am a database administrator with OmniTI. We are a consulting company, and if you have anything you want to discuss Postgres related, you can contact me in one of these various ways. Today, first of all, we're going to see why anybody would choose EC2 over RDS for Postgres. Um, just a quick question. How many of you are already using RDS, EC2, and uh, Ansible? OK. Um, so this talk is basically geared at people who know Postgres well but uh, are beginners in Ansible um, or really any sort of automation tool. Um, because I've talked to people who, are, who think that automation is a, is a headache of its own. And this talk is basically just to show that at least as, at a smaller level, it's really not. It will make your life easier. And related to that, we're going to look at the automation and provisioning designs that are, that are going to make your life easier. And the tools that are out there, and finally, how would you go about automating your system? Um, for this particular talk, I've used Ansible and Terraform. Um, but really, once you, once you see how easy it is to get started, um, not many tools are going to give you a harder time than this. So first of all, why would you choose EC2 over RDS? Um, there can be a couple of reasons, not many, but just a few. Um, if debugging, uh, extended logging. Uh, you can have extended logging tools um, that you can put on the same box as your Postgres if you have it on EC2 versus RDS, where you don't have access to the box that it runs on. Um, same with Postgres's third-party tools and extensions. RDS does have a fairly varied list now, but it's by no means exhaustive. And finally, the resources. It, it's possible. It's not likely, but, but it could happen that the hardware that you might need for your system demands um, is cheaper to buy at one time instead of using RDS. Um, so could be. And the second main reason is flexibility. Up until now, at least, when you're moving anything or copying a database from RDS to another, um, either your local system or EC2, um, you cannot migrate the global variables. So your global variables are users and groups, uh, and you have to create those manually when you're moving. Compatibility with resources that are not AWS related. Um, one major example is replication. Replicating to or from RDS is not easy. It's not possible out of the box. Context, not um, logical, replication work, logical, replication. logical replication, yes, yes. I meant today. streaming. Today, but it still works, and we support DMS. It does work. We did say out of the box, though. For some out of the box, streaming replication, which is the main kind of replication yeah, right now. But yes, logical could work, yes. And monitoring, um, when you set up RDS, you do get monitoring access with AWS's CloudWatch system. Um, but you might have a favorite monitoring tool you use. And it, it's possible that EC2 will provide you greater access for that. So those were the positive reasons someone might choose to get out of RDS. But the negatives are there, too. And you should be well aware of that. It, there will be less hand-holding in EC2. There will be more administration for you to do in terms of security, as well as in terms of monitoring. Um, RDS, as we all, I'm assuming all of us know, it manages replication, backups, maintenance, upgrades, all out of the box. And you don't have to do much um, yourself. Uh, but if you move to EC2, it will just be like managing a Postgres cluster on one of your own boxes. You will be responsible for most of the tasks that Postgres requires a, a person to do. So those were some of the reasons why someone would choose one or the other. Um, if you do decide to go with EC2 and you do think that that's the right thing for you, the first thing to look at is what kind of tools do you have? These are the most common general purpose provisioning tools that are out there, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and Solstack. Anyone who hasn't heard of these? OK, that's great. And if you, haven't, if you have heard of one of these, you might also know that there are two types of uh, implementations. And uh, these four belong to one or the other type, except SALT, which belongs to both. 
uh, push versus pull model. So in one kind of configuration management tool, you can tell the tool resting on a, on a box that to go run its tasks on a particular client or a list of clients, and you're basically pushing the tasks out. Whereas for some other types of tools, you, you basically leave that responsibility onto the client for it to pull the tasks from the server where these tasks reside on. And so Chef and Puppet are primarily pull-based systems, whereas Ansible is push. And Salt, I haven't worked much with it, but depending on how you um, use it, it can be push as well as pull-based. And now what is Terraform? I did not mention that as one of the popular um, general purpose tools. It's because it's not a popular general purpose tool. It's a popular cloud infrastructure management tool. And uh, what does that mean? It basically means if you're doing a lot of work related to um, destroying or creating EC2 instances, for example, you might benefit from, from, a, from a tool that already has inbuilt functions for each of those things, and you don't have to do those things from scratch. Um, can, you do, can, you, can you do cloud infrastructure management with one of the tools we saw before? Yes. Um, you can do it with bash scripts as well. And especially if you're, if you're thinking about AWS specifically, AWS Cli is a great tool. And um, pretty much everything that you can do with Terraform for AWS, you can do it with the Cli. Um, but Terraform, why is Terraform good? Because it, it doesn't only support AWS, but it also supports other um, popular cloud services. Here's a quick overlook on Ansible. Um, it's basically a collection of playbooks and modules, playbooks written in YAML and modules written in Python mainly. Um, and you combine them and you put them on a box and you tell them which clients to run on. And it goes and runs those tasks. Um, you can also see there's a light blue arrow going from the clients back to where we keep our playbooks. And that's basically to show that Ansible can also collect facts from each of the clients. So things like, what OS are you running on? What time zone are you in? And, and use them to uh, find um, better ways to execute its tasks. Why did I choose Ansible? Um, I mainly use Chef at, uh, for, for my work, but I chose Ansible here because it has a great learning curve, which is very, very fast. Um, it's simple. Um, it has a YAML specification for its playbook, which is really hard to make it seem complicated. So um, if you write it and somebody else reads it, there's a higher chance they can understand what you did. Um, it's push-based, uh, at least for on a smaller scale, push-based systems tend to be easier and more convenient. And most importantly, uh, the Ansible Galaxy part, which is a central repository of uh, user-provided modules, you can write one and, and put it in there as well. And like most of these repositories, there are going to be modules of all quality types, but you have to choose which one works for you. And now on to design. Um, what do you need to design? You, ne uh, you need to have um, tasks in there for EC2 setup as well as destroying it um, if you need to do that. Postgres installs, reinstalls, uh, dependency management, tuning and customization, replication, backups, monitoring, and finally failover. Is there any such thing as a bad design when, you, when it comes to Postgres automation? Yes, and it, and it tends to hurt. First and, first and foremost, stay away from ugly hacks. When you, when you start designing your stuff and start building tasks, and, you, and the, for the first few times you put them together to make them work, and something doesn't work, and you'll be tempted to just put in ugly hacks in there just to make them work. Stay away from that, because they're only going to get worse with time. Um, choose the most popular, um, not the most popular, but the most useful tool, most straightforward tool for that. Um, in this case, I'm not sure why they use a bar graph. For those who, can, who are sitting far off, the x-axis is each of the states in the US, and the day of the month is the y-axis. So basically, each bar is representing which day of which month. Um, the presidential primary is going to be held. Um, no reason why it couldn't be represented in the form of a calendar. So same, same applies for your automation design as well. Also, make sure that uh, one of the less frequent tasks you do doesn't render your more frequent routine tasks uh, useless or unusable. Um, one example of this that, ten that could happen is if you have a rebuild 
task playbook uh, or a role and a usual replication role. Replication has to run all the time, but rebuild doesn't happen that often or as often as replication does, which is all the time. And you, don't, you want to make sure beforehand that if you rebuild one of the slaves, it wouldn't um, stop replication or stop handling or, or supporting replication for your other um, replicas. So there can be many such modules that do not go with each other. Again, for example, if you're doing major upgrades or migrations, you still want to make sure that your routine um, uh, automation run or provisioning run does happen, it doesn't break something, or that you're not manually responsible to handle those things, because that is what automation is there for. Um, so you need to handle those cases beforehand. And finally, your documentation needs to be very clear and concise. Um, it, 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 it need, you need to name things properly and, and so that they don't confuse between the various tasks because it can provide proof to be very dangerous. On to the setup and initialization. So this, is, this part is Terraform, and it's very little of that, um, just basically a demo. Um, like most tools, um, Terraform has a variables file in its simplest form and a main file. And in the variables file, I'm basically telling it what credential it, it needs to go to AWS and do its magic. And I'm telling it which region to go to. And in the main file, after telling it what, what variables it needs to use, I'm here basically saying, create two small instances for me uh, running Ubuntu. Um, and that's basically the simplest form of, uh, of initializing clusters via Terraform. There is some optional little bit of provisioning that you can do in Terraform if you want to do it. There is an option. It's good to know. Um, like here, I'm, I'm installing a couple of packages. And finally, when you're, when you're done specifying your, your keys and credentials and telling it what exactly to create, how many of them to create, the literal command is Terraform apply. And once you do that, you see that the options that I provided um, Terraform uses and the ones that I didn't, it computes, which is basically takes the default and tries to put it in. And once it's applied, you should be able to see it on your, on your console. In this case, it's, an, it's a terminated instance, but um, it should show running. Installation. Um, and now it's all Ansible from now, YAML. Um, for those of you who haven't touched uh, Ansible before, um, have you, uh, those people who haven't touched Ansible but have worked with some other configuration or provisioning tool, can you raise your hand? OK. Um, for those of you who haven't done uh, this part at all, um, Ansible playbook, Ansible is organized in the form of playbooks, which is basically what a particular task that you want to handle. So in this case, I have a playbook for Postgres cluster management. And then within that playbook, it's a directory. Um, and in that directory, I will have a main YAML file, where, which is basically the control center of what I'm, what I'm going to do, which rules I'm going to use. And roles are basically the specific subtasks like um, replication, failover, and stuff like that. So I'm going to have a subdirectory for roles. And you can, you can design it differently, but this is how I have done things. So you can see that in the main file, I'm basically using the PG install role when I want to install stuff. And I have switches for those. And you might be wondering where those switches are defined. Um, Ansible, each Ansible playbook also should have a subdirectory for its attributes, um, which is basically files where you can define your variables for various tasks. And uh, one of those files, in my case, is the switches. Uh, why have I used switches, and is there an alternative? Yes, of course, there's an alternative. But in my experience, it seemed easier to just manage everything with switches um, because integration test becomes easier. Um, just, ha just having to do everything in, in one particular file, turning things on and off and, and looking at what breaks and what doesn't. Um, but definitely, there's alternatives to this. And so if you look down, you will see that I have groups of hosts that I'm, uh, that I'm calling particular roles for. Um, and so PG master, PG slave, and then uh, based on what switches are on, I'm calling the rebuild role as well as promote slave role. Uh, what, are the, what are these hosts that I've defined, streaming master and streaming slaves? Um, along with the main file in Ansible head directory, 
I also have a host file. Now the host file can, can reside elsewhere as well, um, but wherever it's residing, um, you can provide a list of IPs where you want Ansible to go and, and, and do its tasks. And within that same host file, you can also define groups. Um, so in this case, Streaming Master is a group of IP or IPs that is my primary. And Streaming Slaves is the group of IPs that are replicating from the primary or primaries. Um, moving on, the first task that I have is to install Postgres. Since you noticed, I guess, that I created Ubuntu instances, um, I used the aptitude module of Ansible to um, add the keys for Postgres packages. Once I added the keys, I'm now going to install Postgres. Um, this is all YAML, and for those of you looking at it for the first time, you can see it's easy to follow. So the first, in the, in the second code block, the first thing is I'm telling what this block does, and then I'm telling the aptitude module of uh, Ansible to repeat over, iterate over a list, and make sure that those packages are present. And so this is how I can iterate over a list in, in Ansible, is provide an item and provide a list in with items block. Um, and Postgres version here in, is 9.6. Um, in Ansible, a variable, it, you can know a, a word is a variable when it's, it's surrounded by two curly braces. So PostgreSQL version in the package names are, is, is a variable pointing at 9.6. Because Ansible is item potent, it's a great feature. Um, so the first time ever, if I'm running this, it's going to iterate over this list and make sure they are present. So assuming the first time, since it's the first run, nothing's present, Ansible is going to go and install each one of these packages. But when I run it the next time, I'm telling Ansible, still telling it, make sure this is present. And what it does is it already checks, oh, it's present. I don't need to install it all over again. So if you've done something, Ansible is not going to redo it. Reinstalls are more or less similar, um, but it depends on your use case. So for example, if, you, if, you're, if all, all this you're doing is because you want to give each developer their own Postgres, um, Postgres cluster, um, you can use Docker. But um, if, if not, you can, you can just do it in the form of flags, which is basically saying, do I only want to uninstall the binaries? and reinstall them, or do I want to want a clean slate? So this is basically what, what it's doing. Um, the when option at the end of the, each task is basically the flags, uh, whether or not those flags are true. And where have I defined those flags? In, in, the, in the attributes portion. That was all about installs. And now it's customization and tuning. Um, like, like most, most other um, configuration management tools, even here, you can, um, in your attribute section of your playbook, you can define what my PG data is, what my configuration directory is. Uh, in this case, because I have it on Ubuntu and I'm using a package manager for my Postgres management, Ubuntu by default has a different location for configuration files. And so I've, I've not messed with that, but I'm telling it, okay, the configuration location is going to be the same as it is by default in Ubuntu, but PG data has to be a, a, a different path, not just uh, the default one. Same way with extensions, I'm, I'm just defining that these are the extensions I need. I have an array here, PostgreSQL extensions is an array, and you can add as many extensions as you want to it. Um, so make sure, but make sure that beforehand you have all these extensions combined, uh, compiled. Um, for example, here, it store and PG stat statements both are contrib modules, so they are already compiled when Postgres gets installed. Um, again, with, uh, with templates and with actually substituting these values that you define in your attributes, how are you going to uh, put it in the file that actually goes on the server? Um, a lot of people, if you look, if you go on Ansible Galaxy and look at the Postgres uh, modules for doing something like this, um, uh, a lot of people prefer just having regex in there. So basically, you just specify it, and at, at, at runtime, it will determine where that parameter is in the file and, and just replace it. I would, however, prefer the other way, which is basically just defining each variable inside the Postgres template file. Again, this is part of the postgresql.com template file that resides in the subdirectory, in the template subdirectory in an Ansible playbook. 
Um, so uh, I would prefer that this, this is the right way to go because it's cleaner in the long run. It's better to understand. Um, you don't have to force people to deal with regexes. And uh, it's more scalable because every time you have to add a, a, a new parameter, all you have to do is go in the template file, make sure the variable is there, and just define it in the attributes file. And talking about attributes, um, defining is just as simple as it looks. Um, basically, just name that variable and give it a value. And the next time Ansible runs, it's going to um, go through, when, when it's placing a template, it's going to go through each of the variables and see if those variables are defined. Now, for, for those times when a variable is not defined, um, you can also have defaults within the template file itself. So if you're not defining a variable, the default is going to be in place. Same way for HBA file, I have two, two halves of my template. The first half just deals with uh, providing HBA values for um, streaming replicas. Uh, why do I have two halves? Why could I not just have the single custom portion? Um, I could, but it so happens that if I have a lot of replicas, I know that there, there are going to be common, common things between them, so I don't want to define them again and again. So as you can see in the first half, I don't have a, a connection role definition or because I know it's going to be the replication user. And so just, just for ease of, of handling it, of scaling up and down the replicas, I have a separate portion in the template for the replicas. And this is what your file, your attributes file, will look like um, to, to make use of this template. And finally, you're going to tell Ansible in, in, in a task to configure hba.conf, you're going to tell it which template file to use. And so it's using the template file where I defined in the previous slide, where I defined what, what needs to be done. And to give, it, give it the permissions and owners and groups that it needs and tell it where to place it. So as simple as it looks. And once you do all of that, you can see um, if I run the command Ansible playbook and give it the main file's name, which is the con with control center of everything, in this case, I have the PG install switch to on, basically telling it to install Postgres from scratch. You can see it's going um, role by role and task by task. So first it's in PG install. It's adding the keys and it's configuring stuff. And this is what you would expect to see when you're running Ansible 2. Um, very clean output. Um, would like to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, I did not go over creating roles and databases um, in the previous slides, but um, that's because Ansible already has built-in Postgres module that does this for you. So it's basically just using a particular, uh, like the aptitude module, it's using that module to create the roles, create the databases, and um, also add the extensions. Finally, the most important part, arguably, is replication. And uh, just like we defined various attributes before, we have to define, we have to make sure that replication-related attributes are also defined in your variable subdirectory. Um, you can put them on, in a separate file or put them together with comments. It's up to you. Um, separate would be recommended because if you scale this, this system, um, you don't want to have a lot of things together in the single file. And that's why there are subdirectories for each of these tasks so that you can have various files, keep it really clean. And just as we did for HBA, we are going to tell Ansible which file, which template to use for recovery, um, what permissions it needs to have. And what that recovery template actually contains is, in its simplest form, just standby mode, what is my primary connection information, and which trigger file to use to promote the slave. Um, I have covered this before. Um, this is just telling you what groups you can have. Um, again, in the simplest format, you will have a group for master, a, gl gr a group for replica. Um, one way to really easily manage failover here would be to, um, just like I have a switch, uh, a promote slave switch, so turn it to on, um, swap the IPs, or have a bash script to do both of these things for you, and run Ansible, and it will make sure, because the switch is turned on, to promote the, the replica and to rebuild um, the old master, or resync it. 
if you're paranoid uh, or your um, company rules say so, um, it's often not the best idea to have the replication password in plain text in recovery.config file. Um, to avoid that, you could also place a PG pass file in your Postgres um, home directory on the replica. And that's basically what this is doing. Um, if you notice here, I'm not using any module here for this, um, just using a shell command that does that. Um, so yeah, once again, Ansible is very flexible in terms of what exactly you want to use. Um, keep, keep shell usage to a minimum, um, just to avoid any uh, hassles later on. But sometimes it's just, uh, if you don't have a module and you're too lazy to build one, just use shell. That's what Ansible is there for. And same way, setting the permissions for pgpass. One thing to uh, remember is pgpass, Postgres wouldn't read the pgpass file for authentication if uh, the permissions are not right. The permission on this file has to be 600 for that, for Postgres to be able to read the password from it. And um, after you've set up replication, you uh, have your um, rebuild switch to on, and you're running stuff. And, and you can see here, it's uh, going by going by each task in the, in the rebuild role and making sure that um, your slave's set up after that. Um, this query can be run on the primary, um, asking, do you have any replicas connected to you? And in this case, it says, yes. I have a streaming replica that is replicating from me asynchronously. Two things to note. Um, the way I have done this here is to use a switch. Um, again, you could just use if conditionals if you're if you think that's the right way to go, but uh, make sure that it would scale well. And um, the task in which I actually rebuilt um, the data directory for the replica um, is done with PG base backup. Um, there are various alternatives to rebuilding it. You can use any other tool you like. All you have to do is switch the command that does the PG base backup. Um, if you are on 9.5 or, or newer versions, you don't actually have to rebuild the replica after a failover. Um, how many of you know about PG Rewind? OK, not many. Great. great. Um, the slide is useful then. Um, so uh, 9.5 and uh, newer versions have PG Rewind, which is basically after you perform a failover, um, you can, instead of rebuilding the slave, you can run PG Rewind this tool, which basically syncs your old master to your new master. And so it, it, it saves a lot of time in that you don't have to rebuild a new replica from scratch. It's great. Uh, a few things that you have to keep in mind is it does require super user access. And make sure either of these two are enabled. Either wall log hints is enabled in your PostgreSQL.config file, or your data checksums are enabled. Data checksums should always be enabled, though. If it's not, make sure when you're doing a major upgrade the next time you enable it. Everybody needs backups. Um, so the first kind of backup we're going to talk about is point-in-time replication. Um, again, I have, a, I have a flag or a switch, whatever you want to call it, for setting up point-in-time replication. I'm giving it all the specification it needs, the, the PG data file, uh, path it needs. And the idea here is to um, upload and store all my backups onto S3. It kind of makes sense since I have my Postgres running on EC2. Um, so for that, um, I have all the credentials given in here, telling it which bucket of S3 to choose, what accesses um, it needs to have, Ansible needs to have. And then again, using a shell. So when I was writing this, I checked and uh, Ansible was working on a Postgres module that does this, um, but it wasn't there at that time. So if you're going to do this now, I would check for that again. It's probably there now. Um, so it takes the dump and it uploads the file. Again, this is all um, rudimentary, uh, but if you, if you decide to do uh, different kinds of backups, the, the philosophy is going to be the same. Just take it and tell S3 what credentials you would need and upload, upload your files. Restores, um, a lot of times when you, when you want to restore something, um, even if you have files stored on S3, sometimes you still have some local files on the, on the server itself. So this is basically, with the help of flags, I'm making sure that the file I want to restore from doesn't already exist on the, on the server. 
Um, if it does exist, I, I, don't, I don't have to download it. If it does not exist, then connect to S3 and download the file and make sure the permissions are fine and then finally do a PG restore. Again, this should now be supported by Ansible module, but uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have to check. One tool for point-in-time recovery that I would recommend is uh, Wall-E for EC2 management. Why would I do that? Uh, is because Wall-E has inbuilt um, functions now that, inter that provide integration with S3. So if you want to stream wall logs directly to S3, um, you don't have to write your backup scripts and your other uh, management scripts on your own. Wall-E has functions that can do that itself. So if you, if you are looking for a point-in-time recovery tool for streaming walls to S3, you can use Wall-E. Um, here, basically, what I'm doing is telling Ansible that Wall-E needs these um, credential files in place with, with, with these permissions and go ahead and create them and finally put the contents, which is basically my, my, my key files and my public key name and the S3 bucket link, and, and put these contents in the file you just created. Um, these files, again, are required by Wall-E to be able to uh, access S3 and, and be able to take the wall logs there. Wall-E has a couple of dependencies. Um, not too much, but make sure they're installed. And finally, you're just... Uh, this is, this is basically the command that Wally needs um, to take a base backup and then uh, continue sending uh, point in time um, wall logs to, to S3. Monitoring and alerts. Um, if you go on this link I've provided at the bottom, you will see if you have a favorite monitoring tool and it's popular enough, it should already have a module in Ansible. If it doesn't, you probably need to coax them into creating one. Um, Circonus is one such monitoring that I've used, and so this is just an example of how I would go about using it, um, basically just describing adding an API key here. And because this is EC2 and a lot of you might just want to go ahead with CloudWatch, um, CloudWatch does have an Ansible module. Um, so here in this, in this slide, I'm basically just creating the alarm, um, telling it what threshold it should alert on and uh, what's the unit of, uh, of the value that it's collecting, description, what's it's do what it's doing, and finally the alarm actions um, go to pager duty or um, et cetera. Failover, um, again, I have switches for that. Um, the switch that I have here is promote slave, which is usually false. Um, but if it's true, then I want, it, want the main YAML file to check for it. And if it's true, then run the role for the failover. One of the many things it's doing is promoting the slave. And hopefully, everything should go well. But a lot of you might want a uh, completely automated failover. Now, um, there are several tools for that. Um, and none of them is perfect. And one of them is PG Pool and Watchdog. Um, people do have problems with this uh, when, when, they, when they're, they've been using it. Anybody using PG Pool and Watchdog here? OK. Anybody using an etcd-based uh, etcd system here? OK. So basically, from, from my knowledge so far, there are a couple of etcd-based tools that do this, that provide automated failover. And then there's PG Pool that does this. Um, both have their pros and cons, um, so this is just one of the tools. Um, they have had inconsistencies where Watchdog doesn't actually uh, determine um, if if anything's going wrong um, with 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 the Postgres that PG that its PG pool is connected to. So. Yes, there has to be a backend failover script, and Watchdog is basically monitoring your PG pool, right. and PG pool is connecting to your underlying. Yes. Um, so yes, that's basically the explanation of this. In this case, you have a primary and a standby. They're replicating fine. PG pool in and of itself is a connection pooler, like PG bouncer, but it's a little more extended now. PG pool two has this uh, automated failover capabilities. Uh, which it does using a, a monitoring tool above it called Watchdog. It's, it's very much a part of it now. 
because PG pool is not uh, just an automated failover solution, it's primarily a connection pooler. If you do want to use this feature, you have to activate it. It's uh, off by default. So to activate it, you have to uh, turn on the master-slave mode, um, tell PG pool what kind of replication is going on. Is it Sloney? Is it stream? By default, this is set to Sloney. So be careful to change it if you're not using Sloney. Um, as you already mentioned, there's, there's a failover um, script that you have to have in place that you tell uh, PG pool uh, about. And then you're, you're giving it details related to what my backend host names are. And um, don't forget to turn on Watchdog. Um, tell it what IP it's running on, how it's going to check whether, whether Postgres underneath it is working. So in this case, the live check query, which is basically checking for the existence for, for a response from Postgres. It's a simple select one. And if everything goes, to plan, goes according to plan, you can see that in this case, the watchdog is that of the standby. And when it comes up, it's going to determine whether it's standby or primary and, and going to declare itself that way. Um, not just for PG pool and watchdog, but also in any other case, even if you're doing it partially manually or otherwise, um, you do want virtual IPs. Um, do anybody here who isn't familiar with the concept of a virtual IP? OK, that's great. Um, OK, many times you, almost all the times, you never want your application to be bothered uh, in the case of a failover. So you want your application to, uh, want your failover to be completely transparent to the application. So in that case, whenever a failover happens, um, you don't want to change the IP of the master database that your application connects to. Um, if, if you have your systems on EC2, um, you can, and RDS does this internally, so you never have to worry about that. But if you do move to EC2, you have to create elastic IPs in AWS. And uh, you can either do this on the console itself, it's not a usual enough activity. Um, you only have to create it the one time, or you can do, do it with uh, a provisioning tool. It should. I haven't tested it, but there's really no, like, it, it should be transparent to the zone. Yeah. And finally, avoid a disaster at all costs. And the, the main way to do that is to make sure your documentation is very accurate. Uh, make sure you have per task based, per role based documentation, and then a, a more general documentation that basically lays out how each task would go along with each other. Um, unless you, you, you are sure that you're the only one building your provisioning tool and you're the only one who's ever going to use it, um, please have documentation in place. And questions? I do have a few um, car chargers here. Uh, whoever asks a question gets one. <laughs> and I have, uh, anybody here knows who Grace Hopper is? Oh, okay, I have stickers, Grace Hopper stickers I found at another conference, so you're welcome to take those. No questions? I already asked one. OK. <laughs> oh, well, here's your thing. Oops. I'll give it to you later. OK, thank you. What's that? Um, I think I'll be putting them up on the um, PGCon uh, wiki, Postgres wiki for PGCon page. You can have one anyway. Yes. Yes. Just not um, about a week, and that to not yeah yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so far, I haven't because when it comes to, if, if you're talking about IP or client-related variables, 
then yes, they would go in the host file. But any other variables, like the Postgres specific variables, I the way I did it was to have a separate file inside the attributes directory, inside the variables directory for each of them. So like I have a separate file for replication related variables and uh, yeah. I did have a problem when I started creating more and more roles. I did have a problem about putting those. So what I did was right now I put all of those different files in my main directory's attributes file and just told each of the role files to, to use it from there. Yeah. No problem.